Greetings, greetings, Margaret Rebels. Welcome to this week's Sector Situation. It is Sunday, March 26, 2023. And I guess it's a few minutes in front of 1 p.m. Eastern time at this point. I'm Wayne. My partner, Ryan, is probably close to wrapping up our market outlook slash overview for the week. So <clears throat> let's cover a few important slides like our trustee disclaimer. And let's cover our trusty intellectual property rights notice, <clears throat> excuse me. And then <clears throat> let's cover this here. Uh, I'm going to just leave it up for a few seconds. This is really for macro measure. Um, I And I, I will probably in the future um, modify this or just do an entirely separate one for sector situation, but macro measure is taking so much time because so much is going on. And really, I think it's mostly about macro, you know, in this as a result. Uh, we could still find some interesting things, I think, in the sectors, but I think we all know that most likely most sectors are going to probably see some sort of a bid if uh, the market's being sque uh, squeezed higher. And it's also going to see uh, just across the board selling. So it's going to be more risk on, risk off until this. I guess uh, prices phase that we're in is is out of the way one way or the other. I think the summary I would give you though from this slide is that I think all right now it's it's really all about the <clears throat> overly bearish sentiment. This is contrarian stuff, of course. That would be contrarian, and uh, the fact that there's maybe <clears throat> li more liquidity making its way into the market as we saw. In the first couple of months, apparently one trillion had made its way in from central banks around the world. Uh, now the Fed's doing their thing. I don't know know how much is actually making it into the market. Maybe time will tell. Some people say that it is. Some people are arguing no, it isn't. Uh, so we need more time to get clarity. Since unfortunately, I don't have a a staff of PhDs that can look into all this stuff for me um, during the week. So we do the best we can to kind of. Uh, glom it all together. But uh, I think that's where we are. And I think you have to be nimble. I think you may as well wait until the market reveals its hand to you before you start getting too aggressive. Uh, because I still think the situations in flux, things things are really could go either way. And um, despite what I'm about to flash, which is the reminder that uh, once the Fed, excuse me, does start to <clears throat> cut rates, you definitely you tend to see your recessions. You tend to see poor performance from stocks after that, which again is a, probably a little contrarian. But I think some people are positioning for good times all over again in front of these cuts now that they're anticipating these cuts. And that was covered in macro measures. So just go take a look at that. Let's stop the share for now. And let me switch over to a different view for us. And I can get got to move a few things out of the way. Once these are out of the way, this should help us to keep moving along. <clears throat> so let me get our grid of 12 sectors up before I share this screen and should come up. Hopefully it's coming up now. And it is, I think. So this is where we normally start the sector situation. And I did some, of course, analysis and looking at things, but I still go back to the macro situation, I still go back to the chart of the SPY and the QQQ. And those two charts look better than the IWM and the diamonds, I think, at this juncture. Not that all can't rally or all could sell off. It's just that <clears throat> if I had to argue over it, I would say, look, the, the, the Qs look the best. The spider's probably second best. And then, you know, the diamonds and IWM uh, probably fills out that order. Uh, but the reason I'm saying that is uh, that that's could be what keeps this market buoyed. It could be what allows this market to advance. Uh, you've got to watch macro measure to see where sentiment is in some ways. But I think I think sentiment and positioning uh, are, are negative still. And I think that uh, the, uh, the chance for them to pull some shenanigans together is just there. Probably right. We're coming to the end of the first quarter. This will be our <clears throat> final set of videos for the first quarter. But more importantly, the, the they typically like to put little rallies together, right? As that we we all know with window dressing. So I don't think any of us could be surprised by that. Of course, 
the news is so fluid right now that that could be Trump by news, right? All new developments could come out. I think there's a lot of bad news is still hit going to hit the tape. Um, my main argument is surrounds U.S. real the U.S. real estate market, which we'll look at in a, in a slightly different way, but also in the customary ways we do in sector situation. But overall, right? I think Ryan was pretty bearish in some of those early morning webinars, and he had a good reason to be with a lot of things breaking down. But <clears throat> looking at say XLF right here, which has been I would say the epicenter for all this stuff, which we've been talking about for some time. He broke down below clear support, but by the end of the day, look what happened, right? And so this to me had a very artificial feel on Friday. I mentioned it in the other video. I do I do think there were probably several factors that zero DTE, all kinds of things that played into that rally, but it just had that kind of waft algo feel that I used to talk about all the time where it just seems unnatural and just relentless. And it almost seems like it allows a little bit of selling. And then once that selling, uh, it, it, I guess, drop, takes the market down a certain a certain little bit, it just starts to buy all over again. Uh, this is really what I saw for a long time in the post-COVID days in 2020 and 2021. Uh, they tried it in 2022, but it just didn't work because things were so... Uh, poorly uh, in shaping up so poorly and also valuations were where they were with rate increases seemingly on the way. And so that's what brought us 2022, I guess, in a nutshell. But if you look here, right, every single sector practically had this big reversal, which again, it, it becomes like, are they defending it? Is it risk back on? Did it have to do with the Yellen situation where there's a meeting that was that was not really scheduled that was convened? Uh, some hope came out of that. We saw there was some zero DTE shenanigans where they were buying upside calls, selling downside puts. So market makers and specialists were effectively net buyers of shares as a result so they could hedge. And uh, well, we all know what happened. So I'm not making a call this week. Uh, I don't typically like to make calls. I like to really frame things in most likely scenarios that I, I see because I believe in being nimble, not only in practical terms and trading in the market, but also in your mind, like nimble nimble in your mind where you're not beholden to this deeply entrenched call or forecast that you convinced yourself had to happen because the market has a great way of taking those. And uh, they've, they're really great at taking those kinds of things and just shredding them and of course, leaving your PL in tatters as well. So I'm a big believer in being nimble. And uh, I don't think that'll change much for the rest of my career. Uh, just learned that the hard way in my early days. <clears throat> and uh, things can, again, I'm not the first person to say these things either, but just I have that personal proof. I'm convinced enough of it. But uh, kind of getting into it, the... the the the, the, uh, the XLF and the XTN, two ones that we think are important, they both were saved. They were both saved, but they both just don't look good at this point, right? So that to me is concerning. Uh, the real estate sector was in real trouble, but look at that kind of bullish engulfing that got put together there, right? And then even defensive sectors like XLV and XLP, they caught this really strong bid. Interestingly, XLY did not. So a lot of the ones that a lot of the things that you look at, XLY, XTN, XLF, not that great. Solid reversal from XLE, but that could have been due to XLE specific factors as well. But still, that did perk up a little bit. I don't think there's anything here, you know, assuming news neutral situation. I don't think there's anything here that blows my doors off in terms of I can't wait to get into that. But what we did note, macro measure, what we've been talking about now for a little while is that, and Brian McCormick, my colleague mentioned this too, XLK, XLC, this is where they've been. This is this is some of the big weights. I've got that covered in macro measure. And if they keep moving those things up, uh, you know, your, your, your uh, Apples, your Amazons on, on down, your Microsofts, your NVIDIAs, your Teslas, whatever, you know, that whole package looks primed to 
it's short term overbought. So we can't be shocked if it sells off a little bit. But if they hold it and start to re-energize it, that could really buoy the markets because I think we looked at it in the top eight holdings uh, would would be in the top the Nasdaq 100. Those are almost 50 percent of it. So the top eight, the top eight names, all they need to do is keep those buoyed or move those up and they can mask a lot of under the surface weakness. And I do think there was under the surface weakness. I think this was bogus, but I've seen these Friday kind of bogus maneuvers carry over and they've at least been able to extend rallies for a little while from them. So that's, that's why I wouldn't get too far ahead of ourselves. I do think, right, we have to be fair about this. Then on some of these, for example, XTN, uh, XLRE, uh, XLF, certainly, some of those at the lows of the day, the RSI was not as high as it's registering right now. So they did really get towards oversold status. Uh, I'm not a stickler on it has to get to 30. I'm not a stickler on really calling it oversold. It's just a good way to describe it. But essentially, right, those had been sold into for a while. So I think what I would say is, right, these were two leaders, XLB and XLI. And if you start to see those get through their recent highs, <clears throat> excuse me, that could, excuse me, mean something. I mean, that could really be the start of something a little bit bigger if they come in for those. But I don't know. We'll have to check out everything we typically check out, which includes copper, oil, lumber. We'll see how all those are shaping up uh, as well. But one thing I do want to share is this IYR. So let me get, I mean, I'm in CMBS. And again, this could be something to keep an eye on as well, because um this gives you an idea what those uh, collateralized, collateralized mortgage-backed securities, how those are being treated. And you can see that, uh, well, this is not this somehow got stuck on monthly. I don't know why it's on monthly, but it's on monthly. Let's go to just a one year. But they're hanging in there uh, so far. But this still looks, right, this looks with this lower kind of cluster high below here. That's a little bit ominous uh, and this lower low. So you got to be respectful of that. So if this starts to roll over again, remember, this is would be a concerning situation. IYR is a measure, is an ETF that really tries to give us a sense of what's going on in U.S. real estate. We did see a big UOA trade in here. And uh, right now, you can see the reversal that it had. Even with the reversal, it's still at about 37 RSI probably got down, you know, pretty low there and think or swim did the old percentage switch on me. But uh, what I'm getting at here is, okay, look, this is about where it's supported before when it was really beaten down. It's below our lower Bollinger Band. So I've got to respect that for now. We'll see what it does. You can see probably the 15 and 20 day, you can pretty much say that's where your resistance is, somewhere near there. Let's just try to We'll try to put a line on that right now just to kind of give us an idea of where we could. There's one. I think you probably need to be fair about this. You probably could really even start back here. And I think it's going to be near that 20 day. So those are your your two lines that you know this would be the first one it needs to take a uh, retake and then come to here. But that's right near the 20 day. So then you'd start maybe taking it seriously. And I like to really see right? If it can do that, then you've got flat lines that are right near there as well. So there should be a lot of resistance if this tries to work its way back up. But if it gets through that, then that's the start of maybe something pretty darn, uh, you know, pretty darn impressive relative to what I'd expect out of it now. Uh, but so that might have, you know, that might be over for now. I just think, look, this is fluid. You can easily say, Look, let's look at last week in SPY to, to like highlight what I'm talking about and why I think you've got to be nimble. I think I was using a different chart, though. I think I may have been using no. My guesses are always terrible on these charts. I apologize for that. I think it may have been this chart right here that had the bear market downtrend. Yep, it has the bear market downtrend lined on it, on it, and it has our triangle. So I drew a triangle in, and I'll make I'll highlight that in blue. Uh, on the SPY, there's that one, there's this one. And we were saying, let's let this thing break. But you see, they put a false, you know, they put the false breakout to the upside together, strong reversal. And then it looks like it's breaking down below the 200 and the 200 to be clear is that kind of violet purple line right there that I'm mousing over, got below there on Tuesday and Thursday and they rescue it. 
They brought it right back from the bear market downtrend line that I've had drawn for a very long time. And it just shows you this line just gets respected, right? It just gets respected. And that's why we, we go back to it. But this definitely had the scent of uh, artificiality to me. But right, we're really right back near the apex of this triangle. We're not too far removed from that. And this is what I said in macro measure. You could very easily be above the 50 in gold, and, and that would leave all SMAs to the south. You could be, you could very easily be below the bear market downtrend line, which would put all SMAs to the north, and you would be you would have another false breakout attempt. So that's why this is so fluid. I don't you can you can always do what you think is best, of course, but I'm just saying that I'd rather have them show me something. And I always think any breakout or breakdown can be a false one because they often are. Right. So I'm not it, it doesn't mean you don't get involved. It just means you get involved and you manage it prudently. Right. If it's not working, you don't overstay your welcome. That's the whole, that's that's in my opinion, just a simple way to do it. It's not delivering the goods and you're not liking what you see once you're in the trade, then get out, hedge, whatever you want to do, modify, morph. But anyway, there's big resistance here. I really think to get it. To make this more convincing, they've got to get through 405 on the SPY, as I talked about in macro measure. And then I think clearly, right, there's going to be some support right where it found support or right near the bear market downtrend line, which is about 390. And that opens you up to bigger plunges. So I would just keep trading singles and doubles inside of these sectors that we were looking at, which are where there they are. So getting back to the sectors, I would just keep trading it that way until the macro picture sorts out more maybe more news hits the tape, and then you could start to see what's unfolding. But if you, again, I would emphasize that if you want to go into the strong sectors, I would go into XLC and XLK, right? Those have been really strong. I wouldn't do that irrespective, naturally, of their, their overbought, oversold status. But if you want to catch some bounce back sectors, probably a very hated sector would be real estate. They probably could try to bounce that back big. More defensive sectors, if you're thinking that way, XLV, XLP, uh, another bounce back candidate for something that, that's gotten wrecked, as they say, would be your XLF, right? So those are some of your bounce back sectors. I I think anything that happens really, my take would be that anything that happens in XTN, XLF, uh, real estate, I think it's more of a trade. I don't know I, if I'd position myself for as like a long-term bull. Uh, at this stage. I, I just think there's too much bad news that's going to hit the tape, nor would I position myself as a long-term bull in XLI or XLB at this stage. But that doesn't preclude us from putting on short-term trades that may work out fairly well on bounce backs. And remember, if they get squeezes going, I do think to get, I do think to get the big squeeze going, that the minimum number they've got to get to, certainly getting above here at 405-ish is a big deal. But I think that 408, 409 would be the next big deal. And then you've got to you've got to take this high up. But if they do that, that could really be the start of something dramatic. And I just feel like overall, this whole situation has enough for bulls and bears to sink their teeth into. I still think it's overall sort of overall bearish at the moment. But the bulls took back control, some semblance of control of these markets with what they did last week. And I know that might sound like, well, how do they do that? But just the way that the math works out really. So I have to respect that as much as I don't think it makes sense, right? That's how I do it. And if these, if this, I've always said this, if these lunatics for, for literally a quarter century, these lunatics are looking to buy stocks at the drop of a hat or a mild breeze, whatever you want to call it. So you just can't be surprised. And their squeeze potential is there. I don't know if it will. I'm just saying it's there. So if they get this thing going in the face of everything, that's what you have to be apprised of. If you only watch this video and you don't want, you don't watch the macro measure because I know it's probably too long, but there's not much, you know, not much I can do about it. Like I feel I kind of have an OCD thing and uh, I even, I feel like I leave too much out of it uh, as it stands right now. Um, let's see what else did I have in there that I could throw in? Oh, I think I had, uh, NVDA, uh, 
and TSLA. I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything that I put. Uh, I put Apple, I hope. Yeah, okay, let's see where that brings us. So let's take a look at this. And this is short-term overbought. You can see that on your RSI with it being like near 68, 69. But if they just back, I mean, the ideal scenario would be if they back this off a little bit, find support and then take the overboughtness out of it and start working their way back up. And remember, they've got the end of Q1. Now I'm sure they want to put some window dressing on there. If they can pull it off, I don't know. But if you just look at this, this is where the bulls are in control. It very clearly, right? You've got this lowest low. They put this strong impulsive move together. Then they have this mild correction of the impulsive move. You've got this much higher low getting put in versus there or here or there, really, which is the key one with my, in my eye. And then you take out the highs. Now, this breakout's been unimpressive, but they've done this in the face of everything <laughs> that's happening in here in Europe, in the U.S. and Europe. And think about that. So these things, like these things, want they want to try to move these back up because if we add really the names together we're talking about, you're looking at about 50% of the NASDAQ 100, uh, whatever QQQ, I'm not sure exactly what the weightings are, but you get the idea that if they move those up, that saves virtually everything. And really Apple, Microsoft, I think at this point, NVIDIA, uh, that is, uh, those are your some of your leaders and they, they are looking prime to go. So if they keep this buoyed, it, it really masks a lot of problems. And there really were a lot of problems developing until that, Again, miraculous save that just came out of nowhere uh, on Friday morning. And, you know, th this is the laughable part. Like, why anyone would trust Janet Yellen and her merry band of uh, meet con uh, unexpected or unplanned meeting attendees after they've clustered things up for decades is beyond me. But, and that doesn't, uh, that applies to any of these Fed people and any of these political operators, not one specific party. But they've all mismanaged our affairs in really uh, not only uh, uh, hurtful ways for consumers and, and savers and all that, but also in terms of, I think they brought really some dangerous stuff about and folks are moving away from the dollar with all the inflation they have yet to get under control. It's just on and on and on. It's been going on for decades though. So that's the overall quick view of these things. If I thought there was something great to share about this besides what I've I've done, I would certainly do that. But we have to see really, I think it's more macro and I think you have to wait and see what happens with some of these things. You can always do what I do, which what I'm comfortable with. And you could you could put some, you don't want to do that. You put some good lines together and you could say, well, where would I potentially do something here aggressively? Right. Be, uh, maybe, maybe there's a good line for you right there. Maybe you're somebody who likes to draw the increasingly uh, slope lines, whatever, to get trades in. But, you know, you could say, well, I need to see something. I'm going to trade this thing as long as it tries to get back back above this resistance line. If they keep pushing it, then I'll take some profits here. I'll see what happens. If it keeps going, you know, I'll, I'll maybe roll some. And if they, they work out and it comes up to the next level of resistance, then I'll trade it up to there. You know, that kind of thing. You could do that. I, I I don't think that we we've sorted everything out yet completely. I still think there's a lot to hit on this banking stuff. Um, I could be wrong. Now, this is where the XLF is supported. You could see that a little bit in there. I'll go to a bigger chart for that, as a matter of fact. But you could see where not that one. Uh, you could see that on XLF on here better. This level's been very close to where this is supported many times. I mean, if you go a little there, one, two, three, four instances before this. So once again, you're at a level or near one that's that they've been able to establish support and work it back up from. So we, we can't rule that out way, be, way below the Bollinger Band on the lower band. So you're extended, but I think this is definitely news driven. They did say that they are going to potentially extend uh, support to all these regional banks. I saw that might be happening. I don't know where it is, of course, over the weekend, but I did see that covered that briefly in macro measure. But this is a fluid situation. So getting really 
uh, getting really, I think, entrenched in the forecast right now is is a mistake. Uh, the way I look at it, I think you should stay nimble again in your mind and at, and and in terms of how you do things. So let's broaden out. Go back to IYR, and then we will. This is this is what we said. That's overdone, right? Mortgages are so pricey versus renting. It's the worst it's been according to a report I saw since 2006. So let's take a look at XHB, see where that look, how that looks. And that looks like they found support right on the 100 down in here. I could extend these, you know, you could see, I've always kind of shared this at some of the weekend, uh, weekend seminars that I've done over the years that what, I, what I've essentially, you know, what I've learned from the market. But in, when you look back on things, it's almost always there's channels within channels within channels. Some of them are smaller and the different degrees and all that. But, um, you know, found support right there. I mean, I think you, it's very clear that this resistance line is so close to the 50 right now on XHB. That could be the breakout point. And maybe they'll try to do that if the rates do start coming down or look like they're going to be coming down even more quickly. Right. So you can't rule that out because I think it's I think it's still kind of a, a certain uh, amount of whistling past the graveyard. But they've already been able to do this from the lows. Right. With rates with rates continuing to move up, they've pretty much have moved these things up. So you can't rule that out. Uh, this <clears throat> didn't get super oversold, but it sort of has double bottom potential if it holds and goes. If it doesn't. Right, which would make more sense to me in terms of my macro take on it. Then I think you're looking at really the one where the 150 and rust dovetails with that lower support line there. So that puts you down somewhere down. I don't know. I guess that's almost like four to five percent lower from here if that low gives way and we see another another leg of selling. I would say there and 200 is not too far below there. So if you want to have an even another target from that point on, but that's IYR, that's XHB. How is lumber? Let's cover it that way. Let's take a look at the lumber future that we've been checking out to see what that's telling us. And, you know, I think this is clearly, right, let, much like what we saw it before, it just tries and fails to rally, comes back in. So again, this makes sense to me, but again, it's still holding on. It's not making a new low, keep our eyes on it. But uh, again, what you may want to do, I hate when it does that. Over, I overshoot just by a little bit and then boom, starts giving me a little message getting in my way of grabbing my drawing tools. There you have that. All right. There's there's your there's your level uh in terms of the resistance line. And that's really the 20-day SMA right now. Get through there. Do you think you can push to the 50th? Maybe there's a little trade in there. I don't you know the percentage uh shifted over on me again. Excuse me. So that is that is that one. Otherwise, right, I think it's clear that there's a support line near here. Uh, probably we could say if you kind of do a flat line with like a best fit, probably down at 401.90. There's something. Uh, and then another one below there, we can so on and so forth. But I think if the low gives way, yeah, you could definitely see a couple, two to three percent more to the downside before it finds any uh, any support. Now, that's not something we're typically going to trade, but we keep an eye on it just as it relates to uh, the housing market, which again, for me, is the, is the big deal. Uh, let's take a look at CL, right? We'll take a look at the light, sweet, crude oil futures because they uh, have been leading, I think, they've been the leader. I think stocks got it wrong, and I think the futures got it right. And we saw this, the oil stocks and oil related stocks were hanging in there, kind of head scratching against this, which was just not joining the rally that they were enjoying. And uh, then this finally gave way and then stock the oil stocks gave way. And so right now I, you, you, you can say, well, it got, over, it got overdone. It looks a little bit better. Everything looks fine. I give it the benefit of the doubt here for now because it does have this higher low put in versus here. It did get 
oversold down in this level. You know, you got at that low that day, you were probably below 30 on RSI. But I mean, you really, you don't have a trend change yet. Things could look a little bit better quickly. However, if you put a line right at about, I'd say a good fit would be right there. So probably given that this level was a problem before, you probably have to wait for Thursday's high at the earliest to start looking at things getting better there. But that might give us a shot to look at XLE. Because I mean, both of them really don't have that great bullish look. Now, could there be a little reversal trade in there? Yeah, but they don't have, and they did start trying to maybe do a little bit of that sort of like a double bottom happening, better RSI reading second time around, outside of the Bollinger Band, should try to work its way back most of the time. I would say the overwhelming majority of the time when you get outside of your bands, they're, you tend to try to work back in like they did here right the first time. I would think they probably try to do that again, but if it continues to fail, right, it's lower highs and lower lows <clears throat> and your trend is broken. You're below the 200 day. There's gaps down here. So I don't I don't think this is easy. You could get right, it's all it's very news driven. So you could get double bottom type behavior. You could get a breakout. You probably have to get at least at the very least above the 10 day right there, at the very least, to start trading, you know, as a bull, I think, because otherwise you're just, you know, you're 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 too early. You know, you're not seeing enough momentum, but at least get through that 10 day as it stands right now. And then maybe you get back up. A lot of times, once you crack a 200, they bring it back up, they they fail to get through and you go. But sometimes there's another test, right, that comes along and they, they might try to push that back up to the 200 um, if they can get some their mojo back a little and get some momentum to, to start flowing in there. But I mean, not not something that I look at and say, mm, I can't wait to buy that, right? That's, that's not looking that good. I think the bulls have a little shot right now at doing something, but overall, it's clearly been under bear control. And they really, I guess you'd have to say that when you look back on it, they probably really took and started trying to take control here. But this was really that reversal there and that loss of support there with the lower high put in. That was your best signal. And you had to, they made you wait it out. It's been, hasn't been easy to trade. Just hasn't been easy to trade, I don't think. And I've tried to put some ideas in here and there. I think, fortunately, I think most of those little single Z, double Z type things did work out, I think, for folks. So that's good. We kind of picked our spots, picked the stocks we wanted with the right setups when the UOA hit. But it wasn't like this was delivering gangbusters. We have had gangbusters deliveries from this space at times, but it's just been harder to trade, I think, over the last, um, well, really, probably mostly most of this year, I would say it's not been an easy trade. <clears throat> and then let's look at another kind of economically sensitive situation in copper futures. And these are, we had a lot, I guess we had a line there because I don't really chart copper that much during, uh, during the uh, week. I'm not really spent, I don't have time to spend on things. I'd love to be able to sit back and kind of publish things the way some of these guys that do their, all they really do for the firm they're at is, technical analysis stuff all the time that would probably be the most fun thing for me but that's not where I'm at right now and doesn't jive with what I'm trying to accomplish at the moment but that would be something I'm I think I'd like to do down the road if I can get certain things in place that fall in place before then and so on and so forth that's always kind of interesting to get things out there that might be different interesting views for people to consider um but anyway uh HG right I mean Another one, not so easy. It is back above the trend that we had, in, that trend line we had in place, though. So we will give it at least that, right? Let's say, okay, you you got you got whacked pretty good, but you made it back above trend. So let's respect that. And there's now two lines in close vicinity, also with the 20 day there in light blue. So I think, right, you got the short term SMAs. See what happens there. If it doesn't hold those, yeah, you're probably going back down even more. But notice, right, that a lot of the longer term moving averages are all positively sloped. So this should probably be given a little bit more respect right now uh, because of certain those certain factors. Um, I don't think it's anything to be in love with yet. I mean, you think you'd want to start to see some highs get cleared out there. And then, you know, a lot of like things happening. But this could start to look better if 
you get a feedback loop going where they keep those mega cap names we talked about. They keep those buoyed or move those up. They, they uh, effectively engender a short squeeze because there's so much bearish sentiment out there right now and people are not positioned for uh, a little mini melt up type uh, of thing. Um, all that makes that possible. And this probably tries to trail along probably people thinking, well, maybe there really is this uh, this sunny future um, that a lot of people aren't seeing, maybe copper sniffing it out. Maybe it would be right and I'd be wrong. I think it would, I'm still more of like, that would be a false dawn situation overall. <clears throat> XAU, another thing we chart every week. We don't, we just don't have the time to go intensive on all this, but this still has that kind of cup and handle with a larger cup and handle that I talked about on the cocktail hour. So um, got to get maybe a monthly. So you saw the cup and handle, I think right there, probably easier to show it frankly on SLB and uh, GLD, but come on, there you go. So there's the big picture on SLV and it looks somewhat similar. I'd say fairly similar to GLD. If you want to look at this really, really big picture view, you'll see that there's a cup and handle. It's a little bit different looking, right? And you've got to be liberal in the sense that you've got to be willing to have a fancy kind of handle development there. But again, I'm not a big stickler. I'd rather allow that, kind of use the fuzzy logic approach I've mentioned before and say, hey, it kind of looks like one. It's close enough. And I'd rather go with it and just manage the trade because these things are um, rather than be a real strict interpretation person on this. The reason I say that is these are really good patterns in my mind. I, I think cup and handles and inverted head and shoulders and head and shoulders and inverted cup and handles for all that. I think these are, are good patterns. Um, in my experience, they not only do they deliver probably better better than 50-50 by a, by a large margin, but I think they deliver powerful movement as well at times. So it depends on the situation, of course, but both of those look kind of like big picture cup and handle. And then if we go down to more of a yearly, you kind of see something even on the daily now. So the inside of the handles on these things, there's actually another cup and handle, if you ask me, over the last year. So that gives you an idea. That could be very powerful getting back to XAU, but I did kind of note, I don't have it the little snippet that I took. I did flash it I think during cocktail hour, but kind of told folks, you know, I would, in terms of SLV and this stuff, I would have just basically rolled, over rolled or rolled at the very least on SLV and GLD with where they got to, because they were kind of stalling out and they were, they had a nice run and they're kind of tough to trade and there's a lot of manipulation and so on and so forth. So I would just take a lot of the money off the table at this point and then stay in a roll, keep the roll on a short leash. If, if if they start taking it down, just cut the roll short, give a little back and call it a, still call it a win, nice win, hopefully. Um, if it keeps going, then just stick with it, right? But I think, I still think there's, this has got really amazing potential, technically speaking, these things, but it's also kind of ominous because when these do really well, things tend to not be all that great. So uh, that, you know, it's kind of kind of like not exactly like the VIX, but you get the idea. You know, the VIX does well. And usually you're not seeing a good thing unfolding in the market. So just be cognizant of that. We looked at, uh, oh, well, we can't be remiss and not cover SMH. So let's cover SMH because this is probably another, besides financials, this is probably the, the bullish counterpart to financials right now. This is really this AI um, development that has everybody uh, excited. I, I think this got a little bit ahead of itself here. You had a essentially, right, you had this breakout above there and it couldn't hold so far. They got one close above and they brought it back in. It's right near what, right near there. You could maybe see a little bit of a back off and then I would expect with all these rising SMAs, they would try to hold it in the absence of a market meltdown due to financials unraveling, right, the whole system. But if this 
is able to take this out. I mean, there's a lot of potential here. We probably need to go to a different, bigger picture view. You can see that. And this is one we've been covering kind of with that inverted head and shoulders, maybe a compound inverted head and shoulders. So let me just throw an oval over that and you'll see what I mean. So there's the inside of here, because I don't want to keep it on the screen. Inside of there, there's a head, there's two shoulders and then two mini shoulders. So that gives you the idea and you're right there towards the breakout. So I think this is one to keep your eye on because if they break this out, then we would probably have to do this right here. We're going to extend this line right here. This is a bigger picture view. So I know it looks a little simple, simplified. I don't, I don't mean it to be like, hey, this is simple, but we kind of need to do that. And then we need to see where that would take us to. And that probably would take us to the way that it's moved up before, I would say, we keep it on what it's doing right now and kind of like least squares it, uh, so to speak. That puts it up there right below. And that's very interesting now that we've just done that. And I'll tell you why in a second, but that puts it up quite a bit. So that could really be a leader. It would clear out a lot of highs from here too that were probably big. But this is really what I call that 290 level to me. If I put the, my mouse on that, that's what I call the breakdown level. I think you could see like it was still holding the trend until there. And then once it lost 290-ish, right, that's when the trend really started to change. And so I've noticed this over the course of my career that a lot of stocks, in this case an ETF, do tend to uh, return to that breakdown or breakout level. It's just kind of like a round trip, like a weird round trip phenomena. Um, so I don't know what to make out of it. It's kind of like a lot of technical analysis. I'm not really sure exactly why these things work the way they do, but they seem to work that way, right? So you stick with it uh, because it's probably the thing that's going to lie to you the least likely on Wall Street. Uh, but yeah, I would say, look, you you get down to there. Uh, I mean, you get back to there as a possibility of put you at the upper end of our channel as well. Uh, but you can't really uh, sh shrug this off. I think that uh, I think this is kind of absurd. But remember, these guys tend to buy now and worry about risk later, and they're buying on on hype now and the potential. And they could very well be right. But again, what tends to happen is you get <laughs> these early adopters. If you get in early and you benefit from it. Then everybody else sort of gloms onto it and there's still a, a, a phase. But then when everybody beyond that finally decides that this is the place to be, of course, that's the top. So, you know, if you're smart when it comes to these new developments, you you might not necessarily have to be an early adopter, as they say in real life, using the technology, this or that. But if you would, if you get involved in the development uh, early, you can do very well in your trades or your investments. And when everybody else decides it's time, like I said, you're probably then selling on news or selling really on realization. And that could be that could be the case. I'm just not an expert in any of this stuff. So I really can't say I'm excited like everyone else, but I'm also somebody who has seen the hype over the years you know, lead people to slaughter it if they stay in too long. And that's why I would come back to market rebellion mantra of DDA, which is discipline dictates action and roll, 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 roll. Like uh, we always try to reiterate that, that the way to participate in these wild things and these developments and not leave all your money on the table is to roll, roll, roll. So that's what exactly what I would do. Now, we do chart VIX. We do chart TNX and things like that sometimes. Um, the VIX, uh, this is, you know, this is back towards the lower 20s. So if you think about all that's circulating out there make of it what you will but that's a kind of re that's remarkable to me as i said in macro measure if this thing gets down another point or two even though it's not on the dead bottom you probably have to start thinking about if you think this year is uh likely to be tumultuous which i think the potential is there for it you probably do need to start thinking about some of those things that we caught talk about in the phoenix portfolio some of those strategies Here's your here's your 10 year yield. This thing's cracked below the 200. Now I know this isn't the security, right? This is really just the just the 10 year index, but this doesn't look good, right? Sure, they reversed this too. 
But you broke down below, I think, key support. They're going to try to probably, I guess, get it back up. We'll have to see what happens. And it could be a big change for all I know. But I think really this trend is more than likely uh, going to be, this trend is probably going to be under pressure now, right? That's what I would think overall until it clears its way through all this at the very least. So it's got its work cut out for it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how they manage to keep going with rates if there's this crisis. Uh, that's why the, the Fed's between the hard place and the hard place right now. Uh, we talked about that throughout last week and over last weekend, I think, and even maybe the prior week. But it, it's been something we've talked about for a while, but I just mean more, more intensely. Um, what else do we have? Uh, oh, yeah, we could take a look at the dollar. And the dollar cracked, but also came back. I think this is really going to be our wrap up here. You know, the dollar, this was trying to work its way up. That was correct. This was just a corrective pattern of this long incoming phase, bearish phase. And now it cracked again. And I would say, look, with everything, all the shorties uh, in terms of SMAs downsloping, it too has its work cut out for it. Again, barring geopolitical probably things could change quickly. But otherwise, this doesn't look wonderful, right? It has the higher low put in, but it needs to do something with it. Or otherwise, you're probably trying to retest here, right? So uh, I don't think there's anything to love there at the moment, unless you want to be an aggressive, you know, short-term trader. And I'm just making overall kind of like bigger picture comments. But on the short term, it, it's probably breaking out from resistance, but again, I think it's going to have the 50, the 10, the 15, the 20, the 100 are all waiting for it. And they're not that, none, none of those are really all that far away. So if it gets through there, it's probably because of news. So I would say, look, in the absence of news, why should we really you know, be that impressed by it now? Let's see what it can do. But overall, right, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't love the fact that the trend has been cracked. This, this was, this seems to, this here seems to be corrective of this. And that means maybe you get another leg lower still. So it does look like it wants to maybe try a little bit of something right now on, on the close of Friday in terms of a, a snapshot in time look. But bigger picture, I still think it has its work cut out for it. So I think on that, I should probably end things. Um, it does look like the potential's there, not predicting it, but the potential's there for them to try some upside because of what they're doing in these big names. And if they can ignite a squeeze because the market's sort of predisposed to frustrate the living hell out of people, you know they're at least going to try. Uh, overall, I still think the macro picture is pretty negative and there's a lot of negative news that's going to fall out still. I still think this is going to be a, a rough year overall, but don't, don't allow that kind of macro take to uh, trip up your short term trading, right? Your short-term trading with all the flexibility that options offer to us, if we take advantage of it the right way and be nimble about what we're doing, you can still eke out some decent short-term gains. And there's nothing wrong with just getting a bunch of singles, 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 an occasional double. And then when we get on the verge of a bigger move, right, then be a little bit more likely to be just a roller as opposed to a trimmer or a closer. Um, that might be if that squeeze really ignites past 409-ish uh, in the SPY, which is, you know, quite a bit away. But we've seen them make that kind of a move in one week, no problem. I think the, I think SPY has an overall ATR on a weekly basis of about, <clears throat> I think it's about 12. Let's see if we can find that one of our charts. And that wouldn't be it. And that wouldn't be it. Oh, Lord. And that's not it either. But yeah, I think your daily is about seven. So I think if we go to the weekly, we'll get it over here. Uh, weekly 15, right? So there you go. Like you could really be right at the 410 from the 395, 96, 411 in a week if they turned it into a really strong week back up. And again, with the, with the, uh, with the order closing out here, we know, right, these, they're going to want to put things on uh, a, a better footing. So just be ready. I think that's the, that's the message. You got to be ready. It's not an easy time. And, you know, as long as you go with the right expectations and mindset, I think you can still do well. And we'll, let's get some more data in a lot of different ways and more news before we 
really get geared up for anything more extensive or longer term. Um, and if it starts to really e e implode or explode to the upside instead, then you know, use these levels we've talked about and breaking through resistance to to. And if you see an acceleration, that's telling you that that squeeze is probably at least underway at that moment, right? And that that could be powerful because a lot of people. I think on a contrarian basis, there's just a lot of people that would not expect that at all. And that's when some of these um, operators do some of their best work. So I hope that something I've shared with you here in Sector Situation helps you out this week or in the future. Well, thanks for tuning in and stay nimble out there.